Robert Ingersoll, although uh, a century ago, Ingersoll used to be a household name. Today, very few Americans, except for us free thinkers, recognize the name of Robert Green Ingersoll. And one of the nice things about your book, Susan, is that you concentrate a lot. Uh, your book is called Free Thinkers. Uh, you reclaim some of Ingersoll's legacy. Can you talk a little bit about the, the man who was known as the great agnostic? Yes, I will. I mean, the the fact is, is the reason people don't know about Ingersoll today is, is that this part of our history has been written out of conventional history. His name actually was a household word well into the, the second decade of the 20th century. He was the most famous orator in 19th century America. Uh, he he could have had, it has, is generally agreed, a major political career, perhaps even been president, had he not been a free thinker and an agnostic. He was lieutenant governor of the state of Illinois, and then in the 1870s he started talking about free thought and separation of church and state and agnosticism. Also, also Darwinian evolution also. He spoke about that a great deal. And he had huge audiences. He spoke in the last quarter of the 19th century at a time when lectures were a form of public entertainment as well as information to more Americans than any other American, including American presidents. He was very controversial, very outspoken, uh, and his name was a household word, as I said, actually into the second decade of the century. And then he was, and he also, he played an important role in something else. It's not that all of his audiences agreed with his ideas, not at all. But public attitudes were very different then than they are today. People would go to hear people they disagreed with, in contrast to today, where I can tell you when I lecture, one of the most dismaying things for me is, and I know it's true for serious conservatives as well, that I'm really basically preaching to the converted. People in America today, they tune into TV commentators whom they already agree with, they go to hear lecturers whom they already agree with. This was not so in the 19th century. And it's why Ingersoll had an influence, even if the majority of Americans did not agree with his absolute free thought stance. He, he is certainly credited with having a great impact on the liberalization of mainstream Protestantism. So that in the last quarter of the 19th century, you have a mainstream Protestantism and a liberal Protestantism, which accommodated itself to Darwin's theory of evolution. And then you had fundamentalism, which wasn't called that then, biblical literalism, which didn't. And those divisions still exist today, of course. Now, what's that story? Uh, somebody went into Ingersoll's home, and they saw his huge library, and they said, wow, this library must have cost you a lot. And Ingersoll said, uh, this library cost me the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually, that's probably a true story, because it's generally agreed. In fact, in his obituary in the New York Times, you know, they said, you know, it was it was his his agnosticism that denied him the high public office that he otherwise would have been so eminently qualified for. Well, he, he was so charismatic and kind of golden-tongued in that era that really treasured orators. Yes. So, Susan, uh, how, how other ways have freethinkers influenced the United States? Well, free thought and, and secularism have been part of every progressive movement. Uh, free thought, free thought definitely gave birth to the 19th century feminist movement. And by that I mean a free thought that also included liberal religious believers like Lucretia Mott, as well as agnostics, which Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony became. Feminism in the 19th century had to be a secular secular impulse, and, and it was, and it was, of course, called infidel and atheist, because religion so upheld patriarchy. So the feminist movement is very uh, extremely important. Uh, secular people also, one of the things that's often used to denigrate secularism is the idea that only religion was responsible for things like the civil rights and the abolitionist yes, movement. you hear that all the time. And, and, and I would not deny, and I don't think any secularist should deny, Liberal religion played a profoundly important role in both of those movements. Uh, the anti but but you cannot say religion was responsible for them because the religious right of its day in both cases was every bit as opposed to the abolitionist movement and opposed to the civil rights movement as as uh, the religious left were was for them. 
Well, well then the, so the early that. establishmentists they were for the most part very unorthodox. I mean, look at Thomas Paine yes. or, or Garrison, who's William in your book. Lloyd, William Lloyd Garrison. But let's go to something uh, younger people remember better, which is the civil rights movement. Uh, I believe that the great power of the leadership of the African American churches in the civil rights movement was this. Uh, people, people who want faith-based money and so on. Just imagine how ineffective those churches would have been in the 1950s and early 60s if they were dependent on a faith-based government dole. What gave the, the African-American church its strength in this matter was that it spoke from outside the government, from outside politics. That is what gave it its moral leadership. And to try and mix up churches with politics, well, Martin Luther King's salary was not being paid by the government. Well, and let's turn to this, the present in the future, and this huge threat um, of the faith-based initiative and, and what's going on with the disestablishment of, of the wall of separation between church and state, which you've written a lot about. Well, I, I think, you know, I think that we're in a very serious situation now because unfortunately George W Bush has had has had a lot of time to affect the federal judiciary his recent appoint most recent appointments to the supreme court justice john roberts and samuel alito are both extremely right wing catholics uh we're not talking here we're talking here about people many of whose views like justice antonin scalia's are far to the right of those of the vatican i mean for example Scalia has written extensively about the death penalty and how he's very happy that the Church's opposition to the death penalty is just the Pope's opinion rather than a dogma. Otherwise, he'd have a real problem. Hmm. These are very right-wing religious people. And although and confirmation hearings have become nonsensical because it's said you can't ask people anything about your religious beliefs, well, you can ask people about their religious beliefs if they're going to dictate their judicial decisions. And I think that, 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 you know, we have so many issues in which legal rationales are made, such as assisted dying, for example, is a good example of it. The, the opposition to assisted dying, that all of the legalisms you want, people who are opposed to it are opposed to it because they believe that only God should have the power over life and death. It is the source of all opposition to it. It's why suicide was a crime until quite recently in legal history, a civil crime. And so that I think that, that the, what has happened to the judiciary, these people are going to be there long after George W. Bush is history. And this is a very serious matter, uh, because we have a judiciary which is far to the right on church-state issues of where it was only 10 years ago. Are we going to keep our First Amendment, Susan? Are we going to keep that Establishment Clause, or are we going to lose it? Well, I think, you know, I think with every judicial appointment that that is made at the behest of the religious right, which are the appointments George W. Bush is making, there's more of a problem. You know, as I see it, uh, I, I know you're a non-political foundation, but I believe that judicial appointments should be a crucial issue for all free thinkers as they think about the upcoming election, who confirms them, what their views are on separation of church and state. It's very hard to get people to focus on the judiciary as an issue, even people like us. Well, we think that your book, Freethinkers, A History of American Secularism, is a very important weapon to re, uh, remind people about the secular origins of our country and what we're about to throw away, what we could lose um, if we um, let the right-wingers take over. So we're very appreciative of, of all your writings on separation of church and state.